Anyway, good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, welcome to our April open house. Um, just as a reminder, um, if uh, we are recording our presentation, um, so please keep your microphones muted. And if you would like to not show up on the, the recording, then turn off your cameras. Um, and we will be utilizing the chat function in Zoom and um, throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to drop them in the chat anytime. And we will have a question and answer portion at the end. Uh, we do have uh, one of our speakers joining us today, uh, Duane Sonneville. Uh, you'll see her uh, in kind of the, the uh, largest portion of the presentation is going to be on spinning and spinning wheels. Um, so Duane does uh, several demonstrations and she is a wealth of knowledge. So um, she's here today. Um, so at the end of the presentation, if you have any questions on spinning or spinning wheels, uh, Duane can, can answer those. All right, so it looks like um, we've got everybody here. So again, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna start the presentation off with a short introduction video to just uh, let everybody know uh, who we are and what we do. Hello, I'm Gina Gregory, president of the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society. In case you aren't familiar with us, here's a quick overview. The Society is a 47-year-old nonprofit volunteer organization receiving no outside funding with the mission to collect, preserve, and stimulate public interest in the history of Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake Village, Orchard Lake Village, and West Bloomfield. The Society's home is at the Orchard Lake Museum on the southeast corner of Orchard Lake and Long Lake Roads. Unfortunately, we're closed to the public with the pandemic. We host virtual monthly open houses and program presentations. We have frequent e-blasts and social media. Explore gwbhs.org with online archives and video links posted here and on the Society's YouTube homepage. There are 10 museum outdoor exhibits you can come see anytime. Our gift shop items are available for purchase with pickup at the Orchard Lake Village City Hall. Some items are available at Orchard Lake Schools Bookstore, Orchard Lake Village City Hall, and West Bloomfield Town Hall. You can support the Society while you shop when you choose GWBHS as your charity to participate in shopper reward programs at smile.amazon.com, Kroger Rewards, and Melaleuca, the wellness company, and photos by hack.com. Every purchase provides a small donation to the society. Become a member, volunteer, sponsor, or supporter. Why? It adds to our quality of life, brings us together, preserving, learning, and sharing our unique local history. We appreciate support from our 2021 program sponsors, Gino's Italian Restaurant, Petite Gardens, Melaleuca, the Wellness Company, and Sunrise of Bloomfield Hills. Our spring newsletter sponsor is Sunrise of Bloomfield Hills, and our web sponsor is Mendel Realty. We appreciate our community partners, the City of Orchard Lake Village, West Bloomfield Library, Parks, Schools, and Township. Plan to attend the virtual 2021 Apple Island Tours, Saturday and Sunday, June 12th and 13th at 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. each day. Join the virtual Zoom presentation at gwbhs.org. We'll share a free virtual presentation featuring a tour of the Orchard Lake Museum outdoor exhibits, volunteer island docents, presenter Jeannot Winter Elk Picor, and Maquandan Mike Jewell with a virtual island tour. 
Apple Island informational panels will be outdoors at the Orchard Lake Museum, depending on weather and COVID-19 restrictions. We appreciate our silver sponsors, Magnolia by the Lake Senior Living, Bugs Beto and the Good Stuff, and our partners, West Bloomfield Parks, the City of Orchard Lake Village, and West Bloomfield Schools. Thank you. All right. So now we are going to get into the actual presentation, just admitting a couple more people here. Um, and all right, so we will get started with our um, presentation. Uh, it's gonna be about a half an hour video. Um, again, if you have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to share, feel free to drop them in the chat anytime. Um, I won't be able to answer them during the video, but um, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So hope you enjoy. to a virtual presentation on various aspects of West Bloomfield sheep farming. Today, we'll look at our local connections, hear about the history of farming in the township from Gina Gregory, and learn about spinning from Duane Sonneville. First, let's look locally at the history of sheep farming in West Bloomfield. Moving north on Orchard Lake Road to the Walnut Lake Road intersection, we see fairly new development. In the last half of the 19th century, almost all of West Bloomfield land was farmed, which continued well into the 20th century. On this southeast corner, we saw sheep graze into the late 1980s on an open parcel of land. This was the last remnant of sheep farming in West Bloomfield, once so prevalent. Then, almost every farmer was engaged in sheep raising with 13 times more sheep than people. In 1880, the wool produced was almost 40,000 pounds. Next, let's learn about the history of sheep farming in West Bloomfield. Sheep farming was a West definite West Bloomfield success story, generally conducted to supplement other producing farm endeavors. In the township's pioneer period, sheep furnished wool and meat, as well as grease and tallow. From 1840 until the end of the century, wheat ranked first or second in the township agricultural production. Sheep flocks varied in size and could be found throughout the township. Between 1850 and 1880, the number of sheep in West Bloomfield nearly tripled, reaching 15,000. There were 13 times more sheep than people. The township's favorable terrain and climate conditions, coupled with the ability of its breeders, whose English, Scotch ancestors were well acquainted with sheep farming, made Oakland County the major Michigan produce, producer of sheep and wool during much of the 19th century. In the 1840s, Cotswold sheep were highly recommended. Cotswold are slow-growing, large, hardy breed. This dual breed, meaning they are good for both wool and very mild flavored meat, did not require high feeding, large amounts of grain, in order to make good growth. They produced annually, on average, 12 to 15 pounds of wool per sheep. By the last quarter of the 19th century, Interest shifted to the Rambouillet breed, a French Murano sheep, highly prized for its dense, fine, near mutton quality meat. Full grown ewes could weigh up to 200 pounds and rams up to 300 pounds, with on an average 10 pounds of wool each. The fibers are usually two to four inches, but can occasionally be as long as five inches and are recognized for their bounce and flexibility, 
which means warmer wool than others. Sheep were particularly vulnerable to predators. In farming the southeast quarter of Section 13, Jedediah Durkee noted among his early experiences, wolves were so numerous that he took the precaution of building high enclosures to protect his sheep. He soberly added, after they had killed 40 sheep near our place, 100 men turned out in pursuit of them. Although wolves were the culprit, in the 1830s, their relatives were to blame nearly a half a century later. The 1880 federal census reveals 19 sheep fell victim to dogs in West Bloomfield. Township cattlemen rose to prominence. Albro E. Green raised sheep on his Hickory Knolls farm, situated on the northwest corner of Orchard Lake and Walnut Lake Roads. While Green practiced a more balanced agricultural product, his flocks, the Rambouillet breed, were considered to be quite fine. Another distinguished stockman was Henry E. Moore. His property was known as the Pastures, with 150 acres along the east side of Orchard Lake Road, north and south of Maple. In 1904, Moore and his son exhibited at seven state fairs and the St. Louis World's Fair, collecting over 300 ribbons with 58, one in St. Louis. A few farmers devoted most of their energies to sheep raising and breeding. Two of the foremost United States Rambouillet sheep breeders were Henry Grinnell and Thomas Wyckoff of West Bloomfield. In 1889, the Rambouillet Association was formed in the United States with the aim of preserving the breed, a very strong and hardy animal, well suited to all climates. Both men were board directors for the organization. Henry Grinnell's farm was situated on the southeast corner of the township. In 1867, he purchased the farm that included both sides of Inkster Road. This colorful character settled down to a bucolic existence, raising Galloway cattle and Rambouillet sheep, which, together with his other farm enterprises, made him quite prosperous. Thomas Wyckoff specialized in the Rambouillet breed. He first began experimenting with Galloway cattle and slowly developed several fine herds, importing some stock from Scotland and Canada. He eventually became president of the Galloway Breeds Association of Michigan and a charter member of the Michigan Improved Livestock Association. Wyckoff then devoted his expertise to sheep. In 1891, he was appointed the Colombian Commissioner of the American Rambouillet Association, which gave him the opportunity to travel to Europe. There, he studied the best methods and conditions for raising stock. On his return, he shipped back a carload of the celebrated von Homier Rambouillet sheep, becoming the first importer of this breed in Michigan and second in the United States. His farm, located on the east side of Orchard Lake Road and north of Walnut Lake Road, became appropriately known as the Rambouillet United States of America firm. This operation attracted worldwide attention, and from it, Wyckoff was instrumental in establishing the American bred Rambouillet that found a ready market across the United States as well as Mexico and South Africa. Nationally, in 1884, the number of sheep peaked at 51 million, eventually declining in 2020 to 5.2 million. Today, this breed remains a profit cornerstone of the United States sheep industry. An estimated 50% of sheep on the U.S. western ranges today are of Rambouillet blood. This is due to their hardiness and ability to thrive in somewhat sparse native grasslands. Rambouillets have a very strong flocking instinct. This basically means that while these sheep will spread out during the day while they graze, at night they bunch together to sleep. This offers them a higher degree of protection from predators. 
than breeds cons consisting of individuals that spread out to sleep. In West Bloomfield, the 20th century ushered in a slow transition from farms to suburbs as new modes of transportation allowed more middle-class Detroiters the opportunity to recreate where livestock once stood. Now that we've learned about the history of sheep farming, let's take a look at how sheep are sheared for their wool. The sheep this size do is just to go up and grab a hold of the, by the wool and try to pull it out and drag you all over the tent. The Australian method is the most widely used method here. <laughs> As long as you can keep their feet off the floor while you're shearing, keep them in a fairly comfortable position, most of them won't fight. So I'll go ahead and shear this and then we'll see if you have any more questions. <laughs> Finally, we'll learn a bit about the history of spinning and the tools used from our longtime volunteer, Duane Sonneville, who we are very fortunate to have with us. Cross, hatch, pull the latch, sit by the fire and spin, take a cup and drink it up and invite your neighbors in. So says Mother Goose. So that's what we're going to do today. I've invited you in to learn something about the craft of spinning. Spinning dates to the Paleolithic age some 27,000 years ago. And how do we even know about it? Because obviously the oldest piece of fabric is only 700 years old and machine fabric is only 300 years old. We see it on drawings and um, cave drawings. We see it in tombs, either in burial tombs where women will have had been buried with their drop spindle or we found drop spindles in Tutankhamun's tomb. Okay, the first form of spinning was finger spinning. If any of you ever asked, answered that ubiquitous question of what do you want to do today with, I don't know, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. You're a spinner. Because spinning is nothing more than twisting opposite ends of the fiber at different speed to create a twist. And the twist gives it strength. So the original spinning was just simply like your hand with your hair of pulling and twisting. Obviously a very slow way to spin. The second was thigh spinning. It's a matter of pulling it out with your warm, damp hand, rolling it, and it created the twist. Again, fairly slow. So the first invention was the drop spindle. 
Drop spindle consists of two parts, the shaft and the whorl. The whorl is the weight at the bottom. There are some paleontologists that believe that the drop spindle precedes the wheel, and that was the turning of the weight at the bottom that gave rise to the idea of a wheel. There are various forms of a drop spindle, and most of them have to do with where in the world you find them. Drop spindles with the high whorl, the weight at the top, are from northern Africa and southern Europe. Spindles like this were found in Tutankhamun's tomb. And you wonder what kind of product they can produce with something this rudimentary. The tapes that wrap Tutankhamun's body had 540 threads to an inch. The best machine that we have today will produce 350 threads to an inch. If you find sheets that are say 600, what you have are um, 300 two plies. The best machine is 350 and Tutankhamun's were 540. They were half wow. thinner than what our best machine could do by something like using something like this. I have a couple of other ones. This one is from Turkey and these little pieces pull out and when you're all finished, you actually have a ball of yarn ready to knit to save a trip. And those with the low whorls are most often found in North America. There are four areas of product that you can spin, animal, vegetable, mineral, and synthetics. Synthetics are all spun by machine. Minerals like asbestos and carbon fiber, again, spun by machine. And the vegetables, the two main ones, even though we do see things like rami and bananas and things like that, would be flax and cotton. And the two main animal products that are spun, even though you can spend, spin buffalo and llama and alpaca and goats and rabbits, are silk from the silkworm or wool. Okay, one of the two main vegetable products would be cotton. 80% of the cotton bowl, 80% of the weight is the cotton seeds. In 1793, when Eli uh, Whitney invented the cotton gin, it made the product usable. Unfortunately, it's been called the best and worst product er, invention ever done because now that cotton became a usable product, they needed cheap labor to be able to pick it. They were sent in, this is a small replica of a, of how cotton was shipped. And please note that I have different kinds of carding combs because the length of the fiber is so short. These are much shorter than woolen carding combs. The other main vegetable product that is spun is linen or flax. Flax grows any place in the world where there's a three month growing season. It's a very tall bast fiber, which means it has a core with fine pieces of thread around that inside and then there's a bark on the outside. At the end of the growing season, you pull it, roots and all, you don't wanna cut them off because that's extra length. You tie them together in bundles called sheaves and you drop them in the local river until the inside and the outside basically rot off. In 10 days, you bring in the sheaves. And if you remember the old hymn of bringing in the sheaves, they came rejoicing because they knew they were going to be able to have clothing. Okay, after going through a break and the extra bark falls off, you take the long pieces of flax and you drop them in a hackle. Think of the hairs on the back of your neck, a hackle. And drop them in and you pull them through. It gets rid of all of the fine fibers, the white that's around it, and what falls to the ground is called toe, as in toe head for children. And that toe would have been used to stuff pillows. What is left over 
is what is, and it can be uh, various thicknesses. The thicker um, flax would be used for making ropes. The finer one would be used for making um, skirts and underwears and towels and curtains and things like that. And if you'll notice the color of flax, we often refer to it as flax and hair, and that's why it looks like that. And of course it can be bleached. Okay, what comes out when you're finished moving your flax through the hackle would be the long fibers. The fibers of flax are called line. And just like you have a cap made out of wool, you have a woolen cap. If you have fabric made out of line, it's called linen or linen. My favorite story about linen has to do with a weaver in, Bel in a city now in Belgium. For a long time, the, only the rich could afford, as the English would refer to it, as nappies. And unfortunately, the poor people had nothing. And a weaver in Belgium came up with the idea that since flax is very soft and it's very absorbent, if he could make it usable enough to give that all families could afford it, um, afford this fabric to be able to use for their nappies, he would do so. And he did come up with something. That fabric came from a city called Ypres, and it's in the French section. It is De Ypres, or Deeper, or Diapers. That was the original name for a fabric, and of course, we now associate it with how it was used, not the fabric itself. One of the four major things to spin would be silk. These are silkworms forming a little nest. They're still in there. These are dropped into boiling water. It gets rid of the spit. And then you look for the end and you start unwinding. And your final product before it's spun looks like this. Okay, here I have some examples of wool. Merino which is a first cousin to the Rambouillet that we have talked about for sheep farming here in West Bloomfield, and other natural colors, black, white. And as you can see, this is wool that's come directly from a sheep, has not been cleaned. Um, there are different ways to do it. You can just rinse it off, or you can, what's known as scouring, which is what I do. It gets rid of the smell. Unfortunately, it also gets rid of the oil, which is very nice for your hands while you're spinning. I have a couple of other things here. These are old carding combs. If you'll notice, they're flat, so they were going to be a whole lot harder on your back than the ones that I have that are ergonomically correct. And why would I have a teasel? I mentioned that they were made to replicate a teasel. Teasel can also be used to bring up the pile on a finished product. So we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about wool. Why is it special? First of all, it was one of the products that you actually could sell, not barter and trade for a different product, but you actually could get money out of it. In 1656, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the word spinster was a legally protected title, just like doctor and lawyer are today. This is someone with a lot of talent who had to turn out a certain amount of yardage per day in order to keep that title. And how does someone have that much time to spend? It was probably the oldest unmarried daughter or maybe an unmarried sister or sister-in-law who, who did some of your spinning in exchange for her keep. And of course, 350 years later, we only remember that she wasn't married, not that she was very talented. Wool is a renewable resource, though she produced wool every single year. It is not a strong fabric, but it's a very durable fabric. And what I mean by that is if you bend the fiber back and forth and back and forth 20,000 times, it will take before that fiber will break. Fire, uh, wool is self-extinguishing. If you think about the colonists cooking over the open hearth, fire and getting burned was a very real possibility. Depending on what your skirt was, if it wasn't wool, you may have put a wool stripe around the bottom because the minute you were, even if it caught fire and you were standing in the flame, the minute you stepped back, it would stop. It was fire retardant. Uh, wool can absorb up to 50% of its weight. 
and still give off heat. So it made it good for winter coats. It can be stretched three times its size and still it has good fabric memory and come back to its original size. Again, a lot of reasons that we would be choosing sheep over maybe another product. I'm going to explain how we get from wool from the sheep to a final product. And I'm going to look at it in the time of possibly the colonists because that's when all of the steps were still done at home. The first thing would have been late May, early June, was to shear the sheep to get the wool. The, old, the older boys, teenage boys, would take the sheep to the local river and run them through because sheep have two things. They produce two things, just like humans. They produce an oil that we call lanolin, and they have suet, which is their sweat, and it's sticky and dirt sticks to it. So by running the sheep through the lake or the, through a river, it gets them clean enough, a lot less work at the other end of it. They bring them home, and the next job would fall to dad. The average colonial family had eight children and two adults. These 10 people would only require about six sheep for their needs, and six sheep can be sustained on an acre of land. Hmm. The job, father's job, as I said, would be to shear. I have a pair of shearing sh scissors, and the reason they're called shears, not scissors, is because in shears, the hinge is on the back, not in the middle. So it has nothing to do with the size, it has everything to do with the hinge. He would, it would be an afternoon's work. He would cut all of the hair off and then it would get put away until fall because there were crops to grow and pickles to make and beans to dry and other things to do. When fall came, those teenage boys would be off to school and mom, the daughters, and the small children would be at home. The first job would fall to the littlest children and they would pull the wool out and they would do, as you can see, what's known as picking. It's a matter of just pulling the wool apart. And sometimes if dad was careless, he might come back and cut where they'd already been cut. And so it was their job to take out those pieces. The second job would fall to the girls because the boys were in school and there they would be age um, six to 10 and their job would be carding. You're actually combing the wool, but these are called cards because they were made to replicate, replicate a teasel, and the Greek word for teasel is cardum, hence cards. You put the wool on the bottom, You start brushing. The better the wool is carded, the nicer your final product. So what is it that you're doing when you cart it? I'm trying to get all of the hairs going the same direction. And here's one of those extra pieces. When I'm all done, I'm going to remove it from the cards. And I end up with something called a roll leg. And this is what you use to spin. Okay, I have my roll leg and I'm going to demonstrate with the first kind of spinning that was done with any kind of machine. A drop spindle. And any wool that you pull out is how thick your wool is going to be, your yarn is going to be and you turn it. They always turn it clockwise. Seem to think that witches turned it counterclockwise. I'm not sure it makes a difference. It's the difference between an S and a Z spin. And you continue to spin until it hits the floor. And what keeps it twisted? The, if you look at the wool under a microscope, it looks a bit like an artichoke. It has little cups on it that are called cuticle, like cuticle on your nails. And when you card them, 
because we're not being careful like worsted wool of putting all of the hairs in the same direction, some are this direction and some are this direction. And so when you spin, they grab together. Worsted. You probably remember or probably have had the experience of not wanting them to always grip together if you get them, if you get the wool hot and you agitate it, you may, you might have a favorite sweater that ended up getting felted because of that gripping. By 1700, they were looking for some easier way it was gonna take less time to spin. The invention of the great wheel or walking wheel. If you were to spin all day on the walking wheel, you would walk some eight to 20 miles. And we're still getting that same twist, but it's coming off the end. When you have a piece, you step over and you move forward and it goes onto the spindle. This is the part that Charles Perrault in 1697 told about when he wrote the story about Sleeping Beauty. It was a brand new product. Nobody had ever seen it. So it was very possible that pricking your finger may have called, uh, caused you to fall asleep. A lot like my kids telling me what a computer can do and I don't know what it can do. This stayed popular because you could use a wheel from your, from your, your farm. After the great wheel, there was one improvement. You notice this walking wheel now has a groove so that the drive wheel is like, less likely to come loose. There are three basic styles of spinning wheels. As you can see with a wheel off to the side, that's known as a Saxony wheel. This is a modern day Saxony wheel with a treadle. The next improvement after the walking wheel was a spinning wheel with a treadle. There are three basic styles. I'm sitting behind a Saxony wheel. These were sometimes called flax wheels with a wheel off to the side. There is a Norwegian wheel, which looks a bit like a table saw, and a castle wheel. Wheels in the center. This one, the smaller one happens to be, it's a castle wheel because the wheel's in the center, but it's also a parlor wheel. It's a lot smaller, but so you could keep yourself busy when you had friends in sitting in the parlor and spinning. This is probably my oldest spinning wheel. It came from France and it has ivory filials on it. The nice thing about this is you could sit by the fire in the evening and spin. It did not require a lot of light to do so. And spin the same way as everything else. You pull back on your yarn, whatever you leave between there is gonna get spun. And you feed it forward onto the spindle. Changes made after the treadle were tabletop items. A very rudimentary one, or the Bryce spinning wheel. John Bryce was from Grand Haven in Michigan, and in 1872, he patented a tabletop model that he thought was going to be easier and more attractive to use. It was in use till about 1900. This is part of the collection at the Orchard Lake Museum. Um, do visit us the second Sunday of each month. After, you, after the spinner would fill one of the bobbins, if you were lucky, you, put, you had extra bobbins for your spinning wheel, and they were put on something called a lazy cake. Here I've done is, or shown um, three of the four colors of wool. 90% of all wool is white, but you also have grays, browns, and blacks. From the lazy cake, it was measured onto a knitting knotting. And this was very good for home use. 
but they outlawed it for sale because if you had an unscrupulous merchant and moved it to the center, you got a whole lot less wool. And so in order to sell it, you had to have something like this called a skein winder or a clock spindle. Mine has a click reel on the side. And this was a job for the young children to measure the wool. And they would keep themselves busy doing stories. One of the ones that has come down to us. Um, I thought it was all in fun, but it was for the money. And of course, that word of money became monkey as we've over the years used it. And mom would sit there and she would count each time it would go click. You're more likely to be familiar with the nickname of this machine. Pop goes the weasel. This is a weasel. Thanks to production assistant Carol Fink, editor, presenter, researcher, and writer, Duane Sonneville, organization, presenter, videographer, and writer, Gina Gregory, researcher and writer, Neil Hepburn, and presentation editor and videographer, Corey Taylor. Resources include the 1880 census records, the 1908 West Bloomfield map, Song of the Heron by Charles Martinez, and other educational websites. Thank you for joining us for this presentation today. And at this time, we will be taking questions and comments. If you'd like additional information on local history or sheep farming in general, visit our website at gwbhs.org and please support the organization. All right, so we hope that you enjoyed that. Um, let me uh, turn this over to our chat. Doesn't look like we have any questions right now, um, but if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask, um, feel free to either type it in the chat or you can unmute and uh, ask it out loud. <laughs> Oh, um, let's see, were there, were there many spinners in uh, West Bloomfield? Um, Duane and or Gina, do you know? Um, I, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, basically they were raising the wool, but people would have kept some for their own personal use. Um, and obviously they would have had a wheel depending on whatever, but by the time for the age time of when West Bloomfield came around, um, a lot of the spinning was already being done by machine. The first machine started um, by Slater. He was um, in 1793. Uh, he was from England and he escaped because obviously the England was not selling their information to those upstart colonists who just broke away. So he went via France, came to the US and set up his own spinning um, mill. Uh, and so from then on, you were able to get some of the fabric and it was a whole lot faster. As you could see what I was doing, it's a very, very slow process. And of course, that's only getting the yarn to do something else. You still had to knit it or, or weave it. And most of the time you would hire an itinerant weaver. It would take, um, you needed a weaver for half the time it took you to spin. Or in other words, two spinners can keep up with one weaver. Okay. Um, we did have a, another question. Our, so the you had shown a bunch of different types of spinning wheels um, in your demonstration. And yep. um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, somebody wants to know, are any of those wheels uh, still used today? Well, I can use them. They're all, they're all mine and they're all at my house. So um, <laughs> you've seen me use a few of them for Apple Island tours, I will bring them and stand there and demonstrate and talk about spinning or answer questions that you have, but all of them are usable. Um, the most famous spinner, he died probably three years ago now, his comment was, if you have an antique wheel, it's probably not as good as it needs to be. Um, because if you had a really good wheel, you probably used it and used it up and it's no longer available. But um, all of the wheels I have are usable uh, and two of them, 
are fairly new. And when I say fairly new within the last, say, 30 years, okay. or maybe the last 30 years. So more commercial spinning, is that done with, with larger machines or, or do the, the spinning wheels still function and to make, uh, to weave? Uh, not weave. Um, they, they function if you want to do it at home, but they're not going to function for high production Got it. because okay. of the time it takes to use them. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you for getting to my question before I could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right. Does anybody have any uh, other questions that they'd like to ask? Any comments? Um, well, yeah, I just want to say it was a great presentation. I learned so much, and um, it's really a big part of our history. So it's awesome to learn about it. Yeah, definitely. I I learned a lot. I um when I was producing the video, uh, I when Duane did the the pop goes the weasel at the end of at the very last clip <laughs> i i was like that's where that's from i i had no idea where it came from so that was, that was pretty cool well i always say people know a lot, a lot more about spinning than they know they just don't know it has to do with spinning mm -hmm. um i noticed uh, tomorrow will be the 160th anniversary of the firing on fort sumter that started the civil war and one of the comments of our our we probably know more about, say, the fabrics that come from the spinning. Um, and one of the main uh, fabrics that they used at the time was called shoddy. Uh, it was made from reprocessed wool. And every time you reprocess, in other words, you had something that was wool and some of it wore out, you pulled it out and, and pulled it apart and respun it. Um, but each time you reprocess wool, you break down the fibers. The shorter the fibers, the more inferior the product. And of course, we're no longer thinking about that fabric from the Civil War. When we hear the word shoddy, we're thinking of inferior. Okay. Um, so Dan and Barb Krauss asked um, if they had a spinning wheel from say the 1800s in good condition, uh, how much do you think it would be worth today? Um, it depends on the kind of wheel. If you want to send me a picture, Dan and Barb, I'd, I'd love to, I can tell you, but a lot of it has to do with um, the kind of wheel, the condition it's in, or any of the parts, um, reproduced parts, that kind of thing. Probably the easiest way to guess is to look on eBay and find something similar. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of people drop spinning wheels off that I put them back in working order. They're never going to be new and may not be great, but at least usable. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so Gina asks, uh, how is fiber spun uh, to be very thin? So how do you get really, really thin fiber? Um, it also depends on what you're spinning. If you're spinning wool, as you saw when I demonstrated with the drop spindle and I pull, pulled the wool up, whatever you leave when you pull up is what is going to turn out to be the size of the yarn. So the more you pull it, meaning the fewer the fibers you have, the thinner the yarn will become. Some of those things are easier to do. Silk is easier to spin because of the incredibly long fibers. Um, uh, flax is easier to spin because those fibers are, can be up to 10 feet long. So it requires fewer fibers to be able to twist together. So those are easier to become thin, which is why they could produce um, those fine tapes on Tutankhamen, for instance. Okay. Yeah, whenever I hear, uh anything about ancient Egyptians, like when you said that their thread count for the for the wraps on uh, Tutankhamen was, you know, far superior than anything that we have today. I, I always think that <laughs> it's so interesting, Crazy. so amazing. Yeah, that we could go from ancient Egypt and have something like that. Uh, and then now to our so called advanced technology that it can't even get can't even get to that. So I think that's pretty cool. They had, um, I went to, I was telling other people, I went to see the Dead Sea Scrolls and everybody was what, looking at this, the scrolls, which I found interesting, but what I found more interesting off on a side piece, they had something, it was fiber that had, was spun so, it was so thin and so tightly woven that they were using it as paper. It was, it was that, uh -huh. that dense. And I found that absolutely fascinating because I understood what it took to get that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Ancient Egypt is definitely, definitely a, a, an amazing thing to learn about. 
Um, they did a lot of a lot of pretty awesome stuff. Kind of a shame that it didn't stay stay with the rest of the world. Didn't keep you know evolving, but um, I guess that's one of the mysteries. Yeah, the problem is it did evolve. It maybe yeah. not yeah. improved isn't always better. Right, exactly. Yes, that's true. Yep. All right. Well, we're we're coming up on on uh, two o'clock. So I think if we're good with questions, I think we're going to uh, close out today's presentation. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. Uh, again, sorry, I couldn't. Can I point that. out that Carol is spinning right now? Carol, oh, I am <laughs> spinning my hair. <laughs> you can't see my my camera either, but I was actually spinning my hair too. Oh, that's so, so funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, actually, we have a couple more questions. Um, yeah, you can make a you can make a beautiful sweater out of this mess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so somebody asked, uh, was there much silt growing in West Bloomfield or uh, nearby? Uh, was there much what growing? Silk growing, silkworms. Oh, silk. No, the, it requires a certain kind of a tree. Um, and they haven't always had a lot of great success, even though they've tried doing that. They're, they, they have a couple of mulberry trees at, at Greenfield Village um, so that they can get silkworms, but probably it's very delicate. And most of the time they weren't gonna spend that much time in this, in this general area. Okay. Hmm. Um, so what got you interested in spinning, Joanne? I don't know, it was always a fascination. I, um, hmm. At Greenfield Village, you used to be able to watch people, they would stand outside and spin and make baskets. And those were the two things that I would stand and watch and ask questions about. I got a chance to learn how to spin from the at the Ella Sharp Museum in Jackson, Michigan. They offered a class. I signed up for the class. I was expecting my younger daughter at the time and she came a whole lot later than we thought. I had her on Wednesday, the class was the following Monday. And my mother said, if you feel good enough, I'll watch her. And I felt good enough and I went off to learn how to spin. But with a five day old and a, and a three year old, I didn't have a lot of time to practice at that time. Wow. Um, but years later, I got an awful lot of practice because um, I, we lived in Connecticut for my husband's work. And I worked um, at the David Humphreys house. I was there as a um, chaperone on my daughter's class trip. And the kids learned about, fifth graders learned about um, um, life in colonial America and inside and outside and what items were in the house. And then they, oh. a third learned to spin, a third learned to weave and a third cooked lunch for all of them over an open hearth. And I happened to be along and I said, let me be in the spinning room. I have general knowledge at that point. And um, oh. it happened to be that one of the docents was going on sabbatical to finish her master's in London the next year. And I was offered a job on the spots, which I took. Why? Um, and so I, I continued there until we moved back to Michigan. And so I taught children how to spin. Okay. Um, let's see, we got one more question. Um, so why was Michigan particularly good for sheep raising? What, what made Michigan good in that respect? Well, sheep, depending on the kind of sheep you have, you can raise them any place. But Michigan was particularly good, mostly because of the inhabitants. Uh, the area was founded by uh, Scot people from Scotland originally, and of course they were bringing that knowledge with them because Scotland is such a good area for raising sheep. So we had sort of similar climate, and they had general knowledge, and so they went ahead and continued the tradition, I guess. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, so I guess I'll do a, a, one last call for questions. Um, if anybody has anything that they'd like to, to ask. Um, and if not, um, I'll share one more, one last video. It's about five minutes, five, six minutes. Um, and it's a quick outdoor walking tour of our outdoor exhibits uh, at the Orchard Lake Museum. Um, so you'll at least get to see my face in that, uh, not in this presentation. Um, so let me get that queued up uh, in case anybody else has any questions. And okay, I think we're good. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen one more time. Um, and uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you. Excellent. All right. And uh, 
if you'd like to share the video at some point in the future with somebody who missed today's presentation, um, you can check out our YouTube page. Um, and I'll be getting, I'll be working on getting all of our previous events, um, recorded events, and then our uh, Historical Society produced videos uh, will be posted on YouTube uh, in the coming months. Um, so, so look forward, look out for those. Um, all right. All right. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you <laughs> Thank again. You. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Orchard Lake Museum. My name is Corey Taylor, and I will be your tour guide today. The Orchard Lake Museum is located on the corner of Long Lake and Orchard Lake Roads in the city of Orchard Lake Village. The museum details the local history of Orchard Lake, Sylvan Lake, Kego Harbor, and West Bloomfield. Today, I will be taking you on a tour of our 10 outdoor exhibits. Let's get started. First up, we have our wayside sign for the Orchard Lake Museum. This sign is part of the Wayside Exhibits Program that's part of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area, a division of the National Park System. This sign is one of 25 panels located around Greater West Bloomfield. You can find a map of all of those locations on our website. Behind the Wayside sign, we have our Green School Bell. This bell was hung in the Green Schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse that was named after the Hartwell Green family who donated the farmland that was where the school was built on. This bell was one of three that hung at different times of the school's history in the tower above the school. Up next on our south side of the museum, we have our Three Sisters garden space. In North America, Native Americans practice companion gardening. That means that they combine the three main agricultural crops of squash, maize, and climbing beans, which promoted a more successful growth for all. Next to our garden, we have our newest exhibit, which is our embedded tree. A society member rescued this tree section in the fall of 2020, and it has embedded street signs right into the bark. In 1928, these two street signs were nailed to the tree as street markers. Over time, as the tree grew, it began to envelop the street signs and the signs almost completely disappeared until the tree was about to be cut down and our member rescued it and donated it to the museum in the fall of 2020. On the west side of our museum is our front porch. The first exhibit we have here is our grinding stone. Now this stone was, would be used to sharpen tools made of iron and guests can sit on the grinding stone and see what it's like to sharpen a tool when the grinding stone is on exhibit in the museum. Next to the grinding stone, we have our doctor's carriage. And this carriage was used in the early 1900s when doctors would travel from house to house to make house calls to visit sick patients. There's a couple of features of this carriage that make it important. One of them are these high wheels. So the wheels would help the doctor navigate the carriage around potholes, which are very common in Michigan. And this dash, which helped uh, protect the doctor's legs from mud and stone and sand that would be kicked up as the, the carriage traveled along. Behind the carriage is our stoneware crock. Now the Western stoneware crock was made after 1905. Crocks like this were used to preserve food. European settlers in the area might have used this in a variety of preservation methods like salting, pickling, and sugaring. Behind our crock, we have this window. Now the window would have been in one of the buildings on the Michigan Military Academy's campus. Michigan Military Academy uh, became the Orchard Lake Schools. The academy ran from 1877 to 1907 and was known as the West Point of the West during its tenure in Orchard Lake. Up next on the north side of our museum, we have our Apple Island sign. In 2019, this sign right here was installed detailing the history of Apple Island. Apple Island itself is a geological rarity. Lakes as small as Orchard Lake don't often have islands as big as Apple Island in the middle of them. In 2018, 
Apple Island was listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its archaeological significance. Next to the Apple Island sign, we have our conglomerate boulder, which you may have seen as you drive past the museum. This boulder weighs in at 4,400 pounds, and it's made of jasper pebbles, cemented together over millions of years by a finer mix of quartz sand. It, this was discovered in Milford and donated by a former GWBHS president in the 1970s as a tribute to the glacier that formed Apple Island and its surrounding lakes. Our 10th and final outdoor exhibit is our archeology span dig box. Now this dig box would be open during outdoor events and during Apple Island tours. Guests uh, of all ages can pick up tools like these, sifters and trowels and shovels and rakes and discover hidden treasures inside the box. Oftentimes guests will find reproduction arrowheads, which is a nod to our Native American predecessors. And that concludes our walking tour today. We could go into so much more detail about the history of this museum, Apple Island, and our four communities, but we'll save that for a later time. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website at gwbhs.org and find our archives, membership and volunteer opportunities, and current events. We appreciate your support and thank you for joining us. All right, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation um, and um, we will see you uh, in two weeks, hopefully in two weeks, um, we have our uh, virtual Orchard Lake Nature Sanctuary uh, walk with Carol Fink. Um, and then next month we have our open house, which is on the second Sunday in May. Uh, I think it's also Mother's Day. Um, and we will be talking with Brian Golden, um, who will be presenting on the interurban, um, so the train system that came through um, our communities. And then on May uh, 19th, we have um, a presentation that was put together um, uh, in 2019 with, <clears throat> excuse me, our Native American presenter, um, Maquandan uh, Mike Jewell. Um, so he will talk about his perspectives on traditional Native American life. Uh, the video was produced by Civic Center TV and will be premiering in May. Um, you can find all of the, the information on our website at gwbhs.org. And we hope to see you at a future event. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for watching. Please support Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society efforts at gwbhs.org. Thank you.